People often think historians just sit around and talk about, you know, tactics and weapons and the home front and whatnot. But today we're going to talk about movies, okay? Do you have some favorite Civil War movies? I do have some favorite Civil War movies. My favorite Civil War movie is Glory. Me too. I, I like uh, Pharaoh's Army very much, a little movie about the, the backwater of the war uh, in Kentucky. And I even like Ride with the Devil. I love Ride with I the Devil. I like it. My, I, I was going to refuse to see it because Jewel was in it. And I couldn't imagine Jewel being a good actress. See, She's think, actually very good she in is, it. And I think I saw it because Jewel was in it. Well, so you're shallower than I am. <laughs> but I, I think that it's a very good movie. Once you get past the quite large hurdle of accepting the African-American Confederate guerrilla, then just relax and enjoy the film. Who would have thought Ang Lee would end up directing a good Civil War movie. I mean, that's, that's yes. he wouldn't be my first choice. Well, then you l led into something right there. Um, you know, you talked about whether somebody gets it right or not. What, and this is the age old question. What's better, to make a great movie with mistakes that might inspire people or to make a perfect movie that may or may not? Do you have come down? Well, I think the, the perfect movie would be one that does both and no movie does both. I think that Glory comes close. It gets most of the big things right. It gets some little things wrong. You know, they attack the wrong way and the, the real Civil War, the aficionados got upset about that. I think the I think that in terms of impact on an audience, the most important thing is that it be well acted and well crafted and have dramatic momentum. And so, making sure that you get every nitpicking, if you have the number of rivets on the, I mean that doesn't matter. The thread matter. counters. No, the thread counters. And I think there's a dimension of that to some parts of Gettysburg. I don't think Gettysburg ever comes to life the way that the very best Civil War movies do. I like Gettysburg, but it, I, I, it, it's, I don't think it's among the very best. Yeah, and as a, I'll say this as a Gettysburg guide especially, because if you're yeah. a Gettysburg guide, you have to deal with the movie Gettysburg all the time. Right. But I'm still <laughs> glad the Buford people come. You know, I, that, and that's it. I can always un undo the historical mess. They might get mad at me, and they often do. When, oh my God, Joshua Chamberlain is not the only colonel at Gettysburg. Um, I try to put it in perspective. I thought he was the I, only colonel in the Union Army. I, well, he, he and, led the Union Army as a colonel. I like Joshua Chamberlain. He was an academic who functioned in the real world. Think about there you that. Go. I mean, who the knew? rarest of who all knew? things. Who knew? The rarest of all things. <laughs> it's just odd they didn't put a statue up to him as they did to others who were on Little Round Top. Yes, and who tried Maybe to get Maybe strong their own Vincent and. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so undoing historical mess is good. I would always rather do this. But I also want to bring up, there's all these movies that sit on the fringe. I don't know if they're Civil War movies or not. I'll think of Cold Mountain and Dances with Wolves, both movies yeah. I love. I wrote a book about Civil War in film and art, and I included both of those films. I think Cold Mountain purports to be a Civil War film. I don't think it really is a Civil War film. And in terms of getting things wrong, it gets a lot of things wrong. Yes. Dances with Wolves is set during the Civil War, and you can make points about uh, how it does or does not align with how I think most of the Civil War generation would have thought about the war, especially on the Union side. I even think that uh, The Last Samurai is sort of a Civil I War I agree. Movie. I really I do. And I, I think of it as Dances with Wolves uh, goes east. Well, let me then move on to another one here real quick, and, and that is we're getting a cue for it too, um, Lincoln. Um, I'm Lincoln. a fan of Team of Rivals, uh, and I'm a fan of the movie. Yeah, I think any actor who plays Abraham Lincoln again is a fool. I think that Daniel Day-Lewis absolutely nailed Lincoln. Having said that, I almost left the theater. In the th second in scene? The second scene, when Me they too. start <laughs> quoting the Gettysburg Address to Abraham. Lincoln couldn't have quoted oh, the Gettysburg God, Address yes. in 18... It, it was painfully... Yeah. Uncomfortable. I had the exact same experience. Painfully uncomfortable. <laughs> and then so when they finish, what, the, the two white soldiers start to quote it, and then the African American soldier finishes it. I thought, oh, really? And, and by the way, schools Abraham Lincoln he as is, well. He's right? lecturing to Abraham Lincoln, yes. as of course many common soldiers did. Yes. yes. They, you know, yes he, there he is to be lectured to. <laughs> he was tall, but didn't understand a lot. <laughs> but some of, my, some of my favorite things in films are how preposterous they were. I loved the film Shenandoah as a, as a boy. I was <laughs> only go. 14 when it came out. It didn't occur to me then that it was kind of odd to have infantrymen in trees <laughs> where they could get to fire one shot, wouldn't be able to reload, but the opponent would know, hey, they're in the trees. Maybe we can shoot them out of the trees. <laughs> it made pretty well. Really a nutty movie, <laughs> a nutty movie. Let's talk about Gods and Generals, which I just, you know, a terrible screenplay. Um, terrible. I, I can't get long. around it, it. It's too long. It's too it's long. Too long. And do we do we really need Stonewall Jackson crying in a parlor for forty five minutes? You know, by well, in the meantime, you're skipping other major war events. My favorite scene is the one between Stonewall Jackson and his prospective cook, where they decide that both Jackson, the general, and 
the African-American who's from Lexington, they're going to both have a great future in the Confederacy. I mean, that <laughs> when a book titled Stonewall Jackson, The Black Man's Friend came out shortly after that, I attributed it directly to those to those scenes. Yes. I actually, though, it, what I like about movies, too, is when you get that little glimpse into time. Now, I never thought that soldiers were actually exchanging one cigar for one half a cup of coffee, but I thought that was a really effective scene in Gods and Generals. I really enjoyed it because you could imagine two guys just interacting in a mm -hmm. river that way. Mm -hmm. Free State of Jones. My thought as I went through the Free State of Jones, which seemed interminable to me, was how many years can Matthew McConaughey go without washing his hair? That was my main thought in that movie. I thought it was so awful as a film. I had to find something to focus on. That's what I focused on. He never washed his hair and still got all the women. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> well, it's probably like real life, actually. You know, <laughs> I actually liked the first half hour of that movie, and then I was waiting for it to go somewhere. It doesn't go waiting. anywhere. No, doesn't go no, anywhere. It didn't. And every every bit of dialogue that he has, that the main character has, seems as if it's headed right for a stone wall somewhere to be engraved for all of us to just read it later and learn from it. I mean, it doesn't seem like real dialogue. It's so didactic. It's so stilted. Uh, and it went on and on. It went on and on. Right. Well, now you write about Civil War in film, so let me try to hit you with one you may not have seen because it's not obviously a Civil War thing, but Sahara. Also, Matthew of course, I've seen Sahara okay. and finding the ironclad in the desert and, and the cannon still work. That's the amazing thing. Uh, I actually like Sahara more than the Free State of Jones. If I, if I were locked in a room and had to watch one five times, I'd watch Sahara five times. Right, good. And the, the co-star of it, Steve Zahn's a good friend of battlefield preservation. That's so correct. You know? So and, and I wasn't even going to make that connection. And that's not why I would prefer to watch it. I actually think it's a better movie. We haven't talked yet about the most famous and influential Civil War film of all time, not even close, and that's Gone with the Wind. For me, the first time I saw it, it didn't seem like a Civil War movie at all. It just seemed like a kind of sappy, romantic movie to me as a 14-year-old. I kept thinking, where's the war? I was disappointed as a young boy. How about now? Now, I think it's a wonderful way to get at major themes relating to the era, including how the Lost Cause uh, interpretation of the war was translated cinematically. It's a well-made film in many ways, and so it's effective. That, that long tracking scene at the railroad station where the camera pulls oh, back yeah. and back and back, and eventually you see uh, more than 1,500 real human beings and a couple of thousand dummies as casualties with the Confederate flag flapping just to the left. It's a beautiful shot. It connects uh, the overwhelming loss on the Confederate side. It's, it's, it's a it's an immensely effective lost cause scene. And you've also got the, the glory, dances with wolves, amputation sort of stuff. Well, every film has the amputation. I mean, <laughs> yes, you need th that. that's obligatory now. And that's a yeah. major myth we need to deal with yes. is the uh, uh, presence of anesthesia in the yep. most Civil War operations. Right. Um, for me, Gone with the Wind, really, I mean, despite the lost causiness of it, if I may, it still stands very well with me. It's a great window into the South, into the 20th century South and their perceptions back then. Like oh, you no, said. It's, it's, it's a wonderful teaching tool. Absolutely a wonderful teaching tool. Agreed. And Rhett Butler and... Uh, and uh, Vivian Lee, just great, great performances, I think. Yes. I'm, I'm a big fan. So let's move on then. Let's talk about uh, another older film, The Horse Soldiers. Well, The Horse Soldiers was a film that I loved as a young person again because there, were, there weren't that many Civil War films, and here was one. Even I knew that it was based very loosely on Grierson's raid. Major stars, William Holden and the Duke, and directed by John Ford. Almost anything John Ford does is certainly worth watching. And I think The Horse Soldiers is entertaining. And yeah. it gets a ton of things wrong. Yeah. And, and the New Market-like scene with the little boys attacking, where the federal defenders don't shoot them, they spank one of them. And I, well, in the real Civil War, you shoot them. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we all know that the New Market cadets must have moved 800 miles first to uh, have their engagement correct. against the It's a Pearson's long men. way to Mississippi. <laughs> yes, indeed, it is. It is. That's right. Red Badge of Courage is one of my favorite Civil War films. I, it's in my top five. I liked the Red Badge of Courage as a kid, too. In fact, I saw it before Glory. It's one of the few Civil War movies I ever saw, unless you count North and South. A miniseries. <laughs> yes, it's All true. All remain. El Cana <laughs> Ben. He was like, before the Emperor was <laughs> in, you know, uh, uh, Return of the Jedi, there was El Cana Bent. No, and, and of course, the evil prisoner of war commandant. Oh, my God, yes. Played by Wayne. Newton. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't get better than that. You're right. It really doesn't. Yeah, I love North and South, and um, I'm, I was a Kirstie Alley fan, too. I, showing my shallowness yet you again. You really are. Um, so, um, then let's move on to The Conspirator. I, I thought The Conspirator was 
was tedious in the end. I understand why Redford decided to do it this way, but by putting the focus on Mary Surratt, it seemed like she was the only one really on trial, and the rest were just kind of background, when of course that isn't the way that it was. And let me encourage you all, uh, four times a year, Fort McNair um, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. will actually open up and take people into the courtroom where Mary Surratt and the other um, male conspirators uh, were tried. And of course, ultimately, her plus three others were hanged there. So four times a year, you get to go on there and it's very meaningful. And they took the furniture from the conspirator and some of the uh, costumes and actually put them back there. So it's really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And then in that same category of movies that aren't necessarily Civil War movies, Gangs of New York. Absolutely. Gangs of New York is almost anything Scorsese does, I find definitely worth watching. And and that's true of Gangs of New York, although there's way too much violence in it. A, a, a friend who's a serious historian of violence in the 19th century United States said there are more people killed in the gangs in New York than were killed in New York City in more than 100 years. <laughs> but there they are, including the number killed during the draft riots. That one scene where they're just lined up almost endlessly, we know there were about 105 to 110 people killed. Not in Martin Scorsese's New York. There are no. far more than that. <laughs> Let me just say that you're going to have a lot of casualties when ships are firing broadsides, basically, into they're a city. They're shelling New York. Yeah, yeah. The United States Navy shells New York <laughs> in the gangs in New York. Yeah, that one, I, I couldn't help but smile. That's beautiful. Uh, but you needed a lot of smoke for DiCaprio, a lot of you smoke. know, to find a his enemy smoke, at the end. A lot of smoke, that's right. Um, well, well <laughs> then let's, let's do it real quick, because you've got Saving Lincoln, which I actually really enjoyed that movie about Ward Hill, Lamont, or Layman, and then sure. you've got Abe Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Yep. I actually, this is a, a confession, I, I find Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, a very satisfying Me kind too. of guilty pleasure. Yeah. I love it because it takes the Gettysburg was the great turning point uh, notion, which I think is misguided, to its ultimate end. Not only is it the great turning point, it's not only the most important battle of the war, it's the last battle of the war. (laughs) After you win the Battle of Gettysburg, it's all over. The slave-holding vampires are gone, they've all been shot with silver bullets, and there you go. Well, and and, and you referred to it, actually, we don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but, you know, finally I know why the Union was able to prevail at Gettysburg after watching that movie, and I found that especially satisfying. And boy, did those trains prove effective in that movie. No, (laughs) They they really did. They went right from D.C. to Gettysburg. Abe swung a mean axe. Uh, He really did. We want, and in real life, Abraham Lincoln, right? He would challenge people to wrestling matches. He could hold an axe out like that. So it's kind of appropriate. And we like to think that maybe Lincoln was a badass. And he only weighed 180 pounds. I actually think Lincoln was sort of a badass. I think that, yeah. Well, let me try to go through these. Our friend Jim Hessler came up with a rating system. And I'm just going to quiz you real quick as we close this out. Okay. Um, From one to five cannonballs for each of the movies. Okay. Okay. So in no particular order, Dances with Wolves. Three. Sahara. One and a half. Glory. Five. Bam! Lincoln. Four. Gone with the Wind. Four and a half. Red Badge of Courage. Four and a half. The Conspirator. Two and a half. The Horse Soldier. Three. Gettysburg. Three and a half. Gods and Generals. Two. Ride with the Devil. Four. And that's our rating system. Thank you so much for joining (laughs) us.